So I come home from work today and I find out that my sweetie wife, my ever loving, <laughs> made a video about Asperger's, which is for non Asperger's people to watch and kind of get a clue, maybe. But Aspies can watch it too. Oh, yeah. Or potential Aspies. Yes. And uh, I thought, well, as I was watching some of it, I thought, man, something needs to be said right here. Something needs to be said right there. So uh, now I'm, we're going we're gonna to kind of like stop it in certain spots, and Candy and I will show up, and I will try to put something in that I think will be helpful. At the very end of this video, uh, I think we should mention some resources that Candy has found, which are very helpful, like this one documentary made by an Aspie girl that has very helpful information, even if you're just a regular neurotypical person and you'd like some tips on how to get along with people, there's good stuff in that video. So, um, I guess we'll get started and uh, let's see what my wife has to say here. Hello, this is Candy from eyes2jesus.blogspot.com and today I just want to touch briefly on the topic of living with Asperger's or now the term Asperger's has been retired for autism spectrum disorder. All right, I do not have a disorder, um, and rather than being high functioning autistic, I think Asperger's for me is uh, a better description. Um, so yes, uh, Asperger's is on the spectrum of autism, uh, but Asperger's is a functional autism. Um, I am able to fully independent fully live an independent life. Um, as to where high-functioning autism, uh, they often can also live a fully independent life. However, um, as children, uh, high-functioning autism will often have uh, speech delays, as where Asperger's usually do not may in fact speak even earlier rather than later. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to continue using the term Asperger's, even though that's um, technically you know, uh, not the word being used anymore, so they need to bring back that word. Uh, anyways, um, I am using my handy dandy Martha Stewart uh, disc bound notebook and I just wrote down several things in no particular order, uh, just some things off the top of my head that I want to address um, for my personal experiences living with Asperger's. There will be some parts that I will not share. There are some parts of living with Asperger's that nobody in the world knows about except for my husband and no one else in the world will ever know about. Um, nothing serious or fatal. These are things that uh, other people would never notice or know about me um, that I hide well. But this just some struggles that I have. Uh, for one, to successfully live with Asperger's seriously you need to get saved. Okay, um, the Lord gave me Asperger's because that was part of His will. My Asperger's is a gift from the Lord. It helps me hear His voice. It helps me have the tools to do the specific functions He's given me as my part in the body of Christ. All right, this thing about this Christianity part of the Asperger's, it's really, really important because um, um, you know, basically, since the Bible is true and Christianity is the actual non-false religion, uh, then God really did make us all, and the Asperger's people have a very special place with God. I'm telling you, you Asperger's people who think that you can't hear God and all this kind of thing because you're not in tune with your emotions, it's, it has nothing to do with that. You, actually, the emotions maybe get in the way of you hearing properly from God. Uh, the thing about the prophets of the Bible, the ones who spoke for God to us down here, the way God chose to speak to us, and you may wonder, why did God, why is God so elusive? Why did He just come talk to us Himself? Well, you know, the fact is, one of the tests in this life is whether or not you're going to believe God exists. And for those people who don't want to believe, God's given them an out, and that is that He had His Word written by men. And so for the people who want to uh, talk themselves out of it, talk yourself out of it. God only wants the people who are truly looking for Him. But if you do look, you will find. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open unto you. That Jesus gave us that promise. 
But the prophets of the Bible, I'm telling you, I go I, because I, I've had this uh, had candy for my wife, and I've gotten really firsthand experience what this Aspie thing is. I'm telling you, the prophets of the Bible, most of them were Aspies. Look at Joseph with the coat of many colors. He goes down there, and he's uh, he's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to get him to do the wrong thing, and he just says. How can I do this evil thing before my God? Boy, that's what he thinks of her idea. But that probably made her mad. She certainly acted like she got mad after that, by the way, she did to him, which was to falsely accuse him and get him thrown in jail. Tell him, to be a prophet of God, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to tell the people what God wants them to hear, whether they like it or not. And if you remember what happened to the prophets, Jesus told us what happened to the prophets. The people killed them. So, and what did the people do to Jesus? Oh yeah, he got killed. You see, we're fallen human beings, and most people don't really like the truth. And what are the prophets supposed to do? They're supposed to go tell the truth to the people that they need to hear, straighten them out, and uh, how many NTs are going to do that when they're all worried about what everybody's thinking of them? These Aspies are so used to people not liking them because they don't get the social cues. They are like the perfect people to go out and tell the people what the deal is. And uh, <clears throat> so here's the thing for you Aspie people out there. I mean, if you don't want to be interested in God, I'm telling you, you're missing it. You're one of his special ones. And uh, the seeking for truth that most Aspies have, it's right there. King James Bible. Don't miss it. Uh, Candy, when she, got to, uh, when she had found God's word and she, she, she then, silk, because she's a seeker of truth, she sought out which Bible versions really God's word. Some of them don't, they don't say the same thing, so they can't all be true, by the way. And she found out the King James Bible in English is the one. Uh, wasn't that a great sense of relief for you to have? And, and, and didn't, as you read it, she, she would read it front to back, straight through, and she's been through it for at least 25 times, maybe 30 now. I watched it. I watched her go through it the first time. The changes were amazing. It just gave her what she needed. It filled in the blanks. And um, there's nothing like knowing that God loves you even if everybody else is goofed up. So it's really been a comfort, don't you think, Swain? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, my wife has taken the test. She has the gift of prophecy. And I see it. And it's been quite helpful. <laughs> so... Wow. She's had a few visions that were helpful for us. She's uh, also, because she's a truth seeker, the great thing is because she's an Aspie and she doesn't do this neurotypical read between the lines thing, she actually reads the lines of the Bible and gets what God really had to say. And uh, it's been fabulous, fabulous. And because uh, studying the Bible is her Aspie, one of her Aspie obsessions, she's very good at it. And... Uh, we, we, we seek truth. We don't worry about what everybody else may or may not be right or wrong about. We can go ahead and listen to that, see if we think they've got something. But uh, in the end, uh, we want to know what God said. And so don't miss it. Don't miss it, Aspies. Don't believe it when those human secularists try to tell you that it's all a bunch of baloney. I mean, the whole evolution thing is a joke. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> And even the mathematical probabilities say that it couldn't happen. Scientific observation, there is the whole evolution things, just a big baloney scam, and uh, it, it would have fallen on its face right now if it wasn't for uh, the mainstream media trying to help keep push it, because the proof is just, just not there. It's not happening. All right. Um, first off, uh, as I'm going through my notebook, so I wanted to show you, I have very messy handwriting. Uh, this isn't a matter of self-discipline. It's actually a matter of uh, fine motor control. I have struggled my whole life trying to have neat handwriting. And um, I do try really hard to write slowly and to form my letters neatly in my planner because I like my planner to be pretty. Uh, but um, if I just write at a normal speed or whatnot, we get this. I can read it. No one else can. Doesn't matter. This is a personal note for me. Um, when I write stuff on the whiteboard for my children during homeschool, I usually write large letters in print. 
that's not as much fine motor control. A lot of Asperger's people have uh, some motor control problems, uh, clumsiness, uh, may have trouble learning dance steps, uh, playing specific sports. Uh, I trained my brain to where I have pretty good uh, physical coordination. I have really good hand-eye coordination. Um, I just can't seem to get the handwriting down. But I am a major exerciser. I've been working out uh, very regularly since I was 12. And that actually helps reduce anxiety. Um, it's I don't know exactly why, but uh, a lot of Asperger's, a lot of Aspies have noticed that uh, strenuous activity uh, done three or more times a week just really seems to help us clear our minds and think more and deal with uh, a society of um, neurotypicals. We are not neurotypical, we have Asperger's, and uh, so we often feel like we're from a different planet. In fact, uh, when I was a child, I actually thought I might have really been from a different planet. I really never felt like an earthling. Uh, people were very strange to me. I didn't understand people. It was clear people didn't understand me. Things didn't make sense. I didn't know how to make things make sense. I didn't know who to ask or what to ask. It, it, everything was just very weird. So as a younger child, I just kind of went through life uh, with almost constant sensory overload. Um, lots of, as a young child, severe, very bad meltdown temper tantrums because the sensory, everything would build up to a point to where I didn't have the logic tools that I now have with an adult brain to deal with the overload. Everything would build up. Um, I thought people were amazing. It's like, wow, this, this, and this is really hard for me, yet these people walk around like it's no big deal. How are they dealing with this, this, and this, and acting like it's no big deal? And then I find out in recent years, this, this, and this was no big deal for them. It was just a big deal for me and others on the spectrum. Okay, so here, Candy's talking about the sensory overload. And it, I don't know that I even understood this until after I watched the Temple Grandin movie. But uh, what this means is, what she's talking about is this. If you have a fan turned on in the room and it's sitting there making a, a you know, a quite, quite obvious noise like the whole time, neurotypical people will filter that out automatically. They don't even think about it. It just kind of fades into the background. You just listen to everybody talk, or what, you listen to this person talk while those two people have a conversation over there, or something like that. Just, uh, that's not how it is for the Aspies. And I, I, I one oh, of the things yeah. I'm nonstop right now, hearing our air cleaner going on the other side of the room. Hear it nonstop. Yeah, maybe I should have turned it off <laughs> because maybe it would have been better for the video to have it off. But anyway, there's an air filter over there, and I forgot it was even on. But my wife is constantly aware that it's on. And now here's the cool thing. I think, okay, so, so that what I think if, if Asperger's is anything, as, as an essential thing, if it's anything, it's this lack of filtering. It's the lack of being able to make stuff fade into the background. It's always up front and present with them. And um, that's got its bonuses too. So. One of the things that Candy has shown me over the years is some of these pictures of the Aspie brain versus the net standard brain. And it's got a whole lot more electrical connections. I think some of those connections are formed in order to deal with the sensory overload. So usually Aspies like Tesla or Einstein uh, as a matter of fact, I saw a video a while back that Candy had found, and this one lady's research, who was from Australia, seemed to indicate that pretty much all of our major advancements in technology was coming from these Aspies. And I think that them having to deal with the sensory overload grows their brain. It's already, been a, it's already a scientific fact that if you use your brain more and you work it more, you will grow more dendrites. You will have a brain that's got more connections, more able to relate things, and, and, and they'll be, it will be able to think better. It's really, it's truly a use it or lose it situation. And so that's why it's important to stimulate your, your kids' brains when they're young and they're growing. You will really help them to be able to have an easier time of it when they're older, just comprehending what the life and, and 
dealing with things. But the sensory overload for the Aspies forces them to do that, even if their parents aren't really that active in trying to get them to grow. And I think that's why they usually have, what, about 25% bigger brain? Yeah, I'm not sure about the percentage, but yeah, it's definitely bigger. Yeah, usually the frontal lobe area, the thinking area, is bigger. And then back there in, that, in the stem area where it's more of the animal stuff, like the ability to pick up eye contact and all that kind of stuff, like, like animals have, that's the part that's a little less active and to compensate for it. And that's maybe where the filtering is missing. And to compensate for it, I think they grow more frontal lobe. They, get, they become more cognitive. They usually have high IQ uh, test scores. So um, that's what it is. I didn't get it for a long time with this. This filtering thing was about that my wife would be mentioning from time to time. And it, it's the inability to filter out. On the other hand, she's able to be in a crowded room, and because she's had to deal with it, she can kind of hear five or six different conversations at once. So, and of course, being a female, so she can multitask a little more and do that. Nah, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's why she talks about getting exhausted when she goes socializing. When I watch, when I watch, when I hear her say she gets exhausted socializing, the first thing that comes to my mind is, "Well, you're trying too hard." No, she's she's having to deal with all the sounds that you and I filter out, the silverware clinking in the background, uh, the dog barking in the yard, all up front and present, and she's trying to supposedly engage with somebody right in front of her. Yeah, it's tiring. So, a um, little bit of an insight there. Uh, I think that you'll find that my explaining that to you will help based on if you figure out, when you watch the rest of the video, you'll see maybe there wasn't enough information to get that much to you on that. But I'm the, I'm the social buffer for my sweetie. That's right. <laughs> but also one of the gifts I had was being able to hear what somebody else is trying to communicate and and then be able to say it in a in a way that's more obvious for everybody to get. That's one of my things. Um, and I'll get into that in a few moments. Uh, you know, regarding specifically sensory overload. Uh, one thing you'll notice with a person with Asperger's is um, lack of eye contact or strange eye contact, uh, and that's something that I have always puzzled over. Um, now I can look at a camera. That's not a person. I can look animals in the eye. I can have connections with animals. I can look at an animal. I can tell you what the animal's thinking. I can tell you what the animal is feeling. I can make connections with animals. I've been able to uh, work with animals in such a way that other people are totally exhausted and have given up and it's easy for me. And that seems to be an Asperger thing too. Uh, we seem to be able to work really well with animals. But when it comes to human beings, that's a whole different story. That's, it's, it's foreign to us. It's strange to us. Because people say one thing, but they do another thing. Yet other people seem to understand that, what their communication really means. We hear the words, we see them doing something else, and we're confused. So, eye contact. Uh, an Asperger's making eye contact with another person. Uh, some of us would describe it as uh, painful. Uh, I would describe it as uh, intense, very unnatural feeling, uncomfortable, uh, and it nauseates me. Um, don't know why. Um, and that's just looking people in the eye and having just general conversation. Now, I was in a, a seminar years ago where one of the exercises where you had to stand up and face a complete stranger, stand stock still, and stare them in the eye uh, until, like, for a certain amount of time. It was like uh, three to five minutes. And uh, I guess uh, I did a really good job at that because they actually pulled me and another stranger up on stage to demonstrate for everybody else, and then we all did it again. That's fine. I'm not interacting with that person. I'm not trying to communicate with that person. I'm doing a project. So I can stand there and we can stare each other in the eye if that's the goal. That's easy. But I noticed that the other people really struggled with that and I thought that was interesting. Now, at that time, I had no idea that I had Asperger's. Um, I didn't learn I had Asperger's until my early 30s. Um, 
I always knew I was different. I knew there wasn't anything wrong with me. I knew I wasn't crazy. I just knew I was different and I had always been seeking why was I different. There is something. What is it? And after years of seeking, I finally prayed, should have done that a long time ago, and the Lord revealed it to me. Um, I was actually doing research for a child of a friend who exhibits some uh, interesting traits, and um, some of those traits were similar to traits I exhibited as a child, and some of the traits I still do. And so I did some research on that, and Asperger's kept coming up. And I'd read about it, and it's like, wait, that's me. And uh, then from there, uh, researched it deeply, found out I am an Aspie. Okay, so yeah, eye contact. Um, I don't know why. I try to make eye contact with people, but here's the thing. I feel like I'm doing it wrong. Um, my husband, who is a neurotypical, uh, he explained, I guess people will look each other in the eye briefly, look away, look in the eye, look away, look in the eye. Um, it's very exhausting for me trying to figure out, have I looked them in the eye for too long? I would really love to look away. Um, oh, did I look them in the eye at all, or have I been staring at their teeth? Um, I didn't know people could tell if you're looking them in the eye or not. I can't tell when people are looking me in the eye. Um, I have trouble often telling if people are even talking to me. Um, people can be like, hey, you! If they're referring to me, I probably have no idea. Um, I accidentally snub people all the time. Uh, people will be trying to talk to me at the store, and I'll be walking right past them. I have no idea that it's me they're talking to. I think they're talking to someone else. And my children are like, mom, they're talking to you. Really? So um, that's another thing, too. Um, or people standing in lines for things versus just milling around and loitering. I have trouble telling, is this a line because I want to go over here, or are they just standing here talking? And if they're just standing here talking, why are they doing that and they're in the way? <laughs> so that's another thing. I have trouble finding, figuring out where lines are, where the end of the line is, um, etc. Okay, um, another huge one is um, going up to people and speaking to them. I love the information age. I can communicate and talk via YouTube. I can communicate and talk via writing on uh, my blog whenever I want to. Um, I keep contact predominantly, mostly via Facebook with friends and family members. And that's very comfortable for me because I'm not having to interact with someone live. I'm not having all this sensory flying at me. Um, I can be in a controlled, sensory friendly environment and I can communicate at my own pace or not communicate if I don't want to and just shut everything out for a while. So, so that's really nice. The internet is a fabulous, fabulous thing for Aspies. I'm going up to people and speaking to them. Um, very, very, very uncomfortable, even if I've known the person for years. Um, and starting conversations, forget it. I do it wrong somehow. I just can't seem to figure out how to start a conversation. Um, memory issues. A lot of Aspies struggle with memory issues. Uh, I do too, but my biggest memory issue is funny enough is movies. I don't know what movies I've seen. Um, <laughs> Uh, someone asked, have you seen such and such movie? I have no idea. Go ask my husband. I don't know if I've seen it. Uh, we'll put on movies and it's like, oh, I've never seen this before. And in terms of find out, it's like, we've watched this movie twice. Really? So there's, there's a few select movies that I do remember, uh, but I don't really remember movies. Um, Frankly, uh, I remember books very well. Frankly, usually I'd rather read than watch a movie, but I understand that a lot of people, that's a social thing, and it helps them bond and feel closer to others to watch movies together. So I watch movies with my family. It's important to my family. That it's a bonding thing. We watch movies together, and that's fine. Just don't expect me to um, remember that I've seen the movie. And the children, my husband, get quite a chuckle out of that, so it's kind of a, a fun, funny thing anyways. Uh, routines and systems. A lot of Aspies, we go through life by creating routines 
and by creating systems on how to deal with specific things. And that is why I am so obsessed with my planner. Before my planner, I had a home management binder. Before that, I had a notebook. I always have stuff written down. I have my routines. This is the stuff I want to get done on this day. This is the stuff I want to get done on this day. I always do this stuff on this day. I always do this stuff on this day. I always do everything in a specific order. And I have routines and systems for everything. I have routines and systems for going potty. I have routines and systems for brushing my teeth, which side of my mouth I start on on which day. Um, and that alternates. And what I brush in what order and for how long and with what, etc. I have routines and systems in place for my shower. Um, what I'm washing in what order, how many scrub strokes per which body part, etc. Now, maybe that sounds a bit OCD. Um, I'm not OCD, but I do think some OCD traits can dovetail in with Asperger's. I have routines and systems for everything. Um, my clothes, what I put on. My husband, he just opens up his closet and goes, hmm, I feel like wearing dark blue today. I'm going to put that one on. Me, I open up my closet and I go, what's hanging next? Okay, this is one hanging next. I'm wearing um, this. That way I don't have to try to figure out because I don't feel like wearing this or feel like wearing that most, like 99% of the time. I don't feel like wearing this. Feel like wearing that. I'm just wearing what's next uh, in my closet. Um, you may notice I tug at my clothes. Uh, I try not to do it very much in front of people or the camera. I do it a lot more when I think no one is looking. Uh, clothes are uncomfortable. That is a sensory issue thing with me. I am very particular about materials, about where seams are, about tags, which is a big one. And for me, necklines. I don't like being touched here. All right. So having uh, shirts and dresses here doesn't work very well for me. That's why I very rarely, if ever, wear cape dresses. I have some beautiful handmade Mennonite cape dresses. Rarely wear them because the neckline is here and being touched anywhere around here is very uncomfortable for me. Um, and then, of course, I had shingles in my 20s and so I got these beautiful shingle scars down the side of my neck. So I really hate being touched there as I don't like being touched where I have scars. Uh, so that's why when I'm wearing my dresses, you'll see I I, I have necklines that are a bit low, uh, so I just follow the rule not to show cleavage. I have my necklines as low as I can get away with without showing cleavage because I don't like being touched or rubbed around here. I don't like anything uh, rubbing so or touching me there. That's where i got to try to balance, you know, being modest in my Christian walk, but not being uncomfortable to the point where it's almost interpreted as pain for that modesty. So here's where I make both work uncomfortable. And I'm still covered up. All right. Uh, now, there, there, sometimes Asperger's can sound like a whole bunch of negatives, but there are some serious major positives to it. Like I said at the beginning of this video, Asperger's is a gift. This is the way God made me on purpose to fulfill his will. Okay. Uh, for example, um, Asperger's can have an extreme laser-like focus. Now, if it's on something that's not their strong interest, they might not. But you get something that they're strongly interested in, they can hone in and focus on that so incredibly intensely that good luck getting them out of it and snapping them out of it uh, if they get into it deep enough and long enough. Uh, we can hone in and focus on something, study every minute detail of something, go way further on studying something than the average neurotypical will. Um, and we enjoy it. That's what brings us um, joy. And that brings me to the next thing I wrote down on my bulleted list, strong interests or what a lot of people call obsessions. Uh, we ask these have our obsessions or strong interests. And these are usually the things that we are laser focusing on. And this is what brings us the most joy in the world, is when we can work on and do our laser-like focus on our strong interests and obsessions. Now, we may not have the strong, same strong interests for our whole life. We may be strongly interested in something for several years, and then we get something else and we go that way. When I was unsaved as a teenager, um, and remember I was unsaved, didn't know I had Asperger's, I was totally, totally obsessed with numerology. 
I had my numerology charts. I liked the math of it. I would do everybody's numerology all the time. I constantly talked about it all the time, all the time. Um, of course, when I got saved, uh, I burned my numerology books and charts. It's like, no, not going there anymore. Uh, Got to drop that interest. That is witchcraft. It is a divination and it is wrong. So I don't even want the temptation burning it all. And I did. All right. And the Lord replaced that strong interest with a very strong interest in studying the Bible. A strong interest I still have. Strong interest I will have for eternity. All right, so we got our strong interest and obsession. So yeah, mine, I've got, it's Bible study, uh, it's <laughs> planners, uh, homemaking, exercising and fitness, I love that. And I've also, in the past few years, been getting a budding interest that's been growing stronger in studying um, quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Specifically, I am very much interested in uh, studying the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. Very much. That's, that's, that fascinates me a lot just thinking about studying that when I can sit down and study that I get just big feeling of anticipation and joy um, so that's that's one of my newest uh, very strong interests okay um, one of the biggest problems that a lot of people with Asperger's has is uh, we have a, a trouble or an in a, in a, blah. <laughs> we have trouble or even an inability to read nonverbal communication cues in people all right, and I mentioned this briefly a bit earlier. People will say one thing, but they do something else, but most people seem to understand them and think it's no problem. We see that and we think, liar. Well, you said one thing, you did something else. Liar. And so we have trouble trusting people after we've seen that enough. But other people don't see it as a lie at all because there's some other communication there that's not verbal. So then they say something, but they mean something else. And the neurotypicals know what they actually mean. We just heard what they say. Okay, so we Aspies like to try to be concise with our words. Sorry about that, my ear's bugging me. Uh, we Aspies like to try to be concise with our words because we want to make sure our communication is clear. And we really wish people would communicate clearly with us. Well, I don't know how many men out there are like me, but we also would like people to mean what they say and say what they mean. Sorry, NT girls. Uh, I don't really like the hint stuff I never did. <laughs> I don't know how many other guys are with me out there, but it was really a drag. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, when I found Candy and she said what she meant and meant what she said, it was like a dream come true. <laughs> so for all you guys out there who you actually mean it when you say you want a girl who doesn't play any games, Get yourself an Aspie girl. I'm telling you, just telling you. <laughs> so when I was at age 16 and I found out I can legally homeschool myself, I had gotten a job, I had gotten promoted to a managerial position at the age of 16 where I was managing people in their 30s underneath me. Um, I was making pretty good money, uh, especially for a 16 year old. So I had gotten and paid for my own car. Uh, I began uh, buying my own groceries and preparing my own food because I wanted to eat differently than how my parents ate and I wasn't going to put my eating perspective on them. Um, so yeah, uh, I also bought some stuff around the house to help out my parents. I bought us cable because I was getting tired of climbing on the roof, playing around with the antenna. Uh, and I bought my mom an answering machine because my mom, who is also on the spectrum, she is more on the spectrum than I, uh, had a lot of trouble with answering the phone, and I don't like talking on the phone either. So um, if you're my friend and you call me, there's a very good chance I'm going to see you calling me, that your picture is going to pop up on the screen and I'm not going to answer. Just text me. Better yet, PM me on Facebook. I much prefer that. All right. So what were some excuses given for my weirdness as a child? I was called shy, I was called a tomboy, um, it was said that I marched to the beat of my own drum, that I was quirky and weird, or as the school children would call me, weird and or stupid. Uh, there was multiple excuses that my parents would give for my behavior, um, because they knew there was nothing wrong with me, but they knew that I was quite different somehow. So yeah, that was, oh, oh, Candy's just shy, she'll grow out of it. Well, Candy doesn't hang around the girls, and when she does talk, she talks to the boys, because she's a tomboy. Actually, I just related to boys better, but uh, I really, really didn't talk to hardly anyone, um, etc. 
And that brings me also back to the brain science of Asperger's a bit. I do not have a female brain. Now, I don't have a male brain either. Um, but in a lot of ways, my brain identifies with males more than females because generally men are less emotional and more logical. So when we go to social gatherings where all the women go off to one place and talk and all the men go off to the other place and talk, I will try to go off and talk with the women. Um, I can usually only take it for so long because it's usually a bit more feely and emotional and a lot of the conversation really isn't stuff I'm very interested in. I can't really contribute much. So I will try to be ladylike, graceful, whatever, if I, if I can. For all I know, I failed miserably. And then after a while, it's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go have fun now. I'm gonna go hang out with the guys. So we're gonna stand around and fix cars, or we're gonna like take apart a couple of laptops, and we're gonna hang out. We're gonna do some technical stuff. And hey, maybe I can get them to uh, engage in conversation with me on quantum physics. Men seem to talk more about physics. Women, you bring up quantum mechanics, and you get the blank stare. Okay. So, um, sensory overload. Some people with Asperger's cannot drive, uh, and I, I know why. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of sensory overload in that. Um, I can drive, um, but I prefer not to drive in a lot of traffic or big cities. I specifically plan my outings when I'm doing the driving on times when there's not going to be much cars on the road, where there's not going to be many people at the store, I will specifically plan my driving routes, even if it adds a lot more time to where I'm avoiding as much traffic as possible. So I would rather thing I would rather things take longer and take more time if that means I don't have to have so much stuff flying at me all the time. Um, so yeah, sensory overload. Um, when I was a kid, I was very scared of the vacuum cleaner. It was just really loud. It was upsetting. Um, I would ruin uh, the 4th of July every year for my parents. We would uh, drive down the mountain. We lived very high in the mountains. We would drive down the mountain to a park and we'd watch fireworks and I would be screaming and crying and plugging my ears. It was just so painful. The sound hurt. The bright lights from the fireworks hurt and I would just totally ruin their time. Uh, thankfully now, um, I can watch fireworks. Uh, I still have trouble at parades. I'm the weirdo at the parades standing there plugging her ears. And if I get really sensory overlaid, I'm plugging my ears and doing this. Probably looking like a total kook, but uh, <laughs> I don't like parades. I go to parades as a labor of love for my family. All right. Um, so I already talked about disliked by many, genuinely don't know why. I've had people... Uh, over the years who I thought were my close friends and uh, they would suddenly stop being my friend. They don't want to talk to me anymore. They don't want to be around me anymore. I would ask what happened because you see from my point of view we were doing great and all of a sudden boom it's like a switch went off and now they don't like me anymore and they don't want to be around me anymore. And the majority of the time when I would ask these people they'd say well I'm not even going to bother telling you. You're not going to take it to heart or pay any attention anyways. Probably because if you're just going to give me some NT blurb, I'm not going to understand it. I just want to, you know, explain it to me logically. If it isn't logical and it's just a whole emotional, you hurt my feelings, there's nothing I can do about that, okay? Um, getting your feelings hurt is up to you. It's not up to me if your feelings are hurt. Same with me. People don't like me. It's up to me to have my feelings hurt by that or not. All right, And that's scriptural. The Bible says, for example, to love our enemies. If we're being instructed in the Word of God to love our enemies, then obviously we can choose to love or not to love. Correct? We can choose our emotions. Now, sometimes they're just going to well up before we catch them. But we can choose to love someone. We can choose not to love someone, etc. All right. Um, we have taken steps... Um, studying um, possible environmental causes of autism and Asperger's. While I do believe God intended for me to have Asperger's, I, I praise the Lord daily that none of my children have autism or Asperger's. Um, because I really do think uh, it is a very hard life. And uh, as probably all mothers, including me, we don't want our children to have a hard life. So my will for my children is that they don't have Asperger's. I praise God that that seems to be His will as well for my children. Um, and we have um, taken certain measures of certain environmental things to try to reduce their chances 
of having Asperger's when they were younger. And I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, but uh, none of my children have it. They're all neurotypical. Um, that brings me big relief. It also, constant surprises. They will do stuff with no anxiety, with total ease, and I'm sitting over there scared to death for them. And I'm like, wait, they have no anxiety. They're not uncomfortable. They're doing it right. Wow! And I'll just sit back and watch them interact and socialize. And I'm just, I'm just in awe. I'm like, how do they do that? You know, I've tried um, watching people, um, especially when I was a teenager and when I was a younger adult, uh, watching people socialize and seeing if it was a success or not, and then copying that in another situation. Totally flops with me. I do it wrong. <laughs> so, um, some people with Asperger's, especially it seems to be with females with Asperger's, will try wearing a mask. They'll try to pretend that they don't have it. They will try to find a person or people that they study, emulate, and copy, and they just try to copy it all the time. That um, If you can do it, kudos. I am an extreme failure at that, so um, I. this is me, this is what you get. Take it or leave it, uh, a lot of people seem to hate me, and oh well. Um, nothing new to me, that's been the story of my life. Um, but uh, yeah, um, socializing, even if you're not wearing the mask and you're just being you, uh, for an Aspie is exhausting okay so uh yeah severe anxiety anxiety is the monster i fight every single day i get anxiety from just normal everyday things um i have anxiety about telling you what gives me anxiety so i am not <laughs> i'm not even going to tell you what gives me anxiety other than telling you that telling you what gives me anxiety would give me anxiety i'll give you that one um before i was a christian um i was very stressed out um very depressed a lot. Uh, I was suicidal. And um, now that I'm a Christian, I have God's Holy Spirit within me and I have the peace of God. And when I get my anxiety, which I get several times a day, every day, I give it to God. You know, Heavenly Father, I need you to take this and take care of this for me because I am freaking out inside. And I need to give this to you because I can't, I can't, I can't. And then on the outside, can't tell. I'm doing these things. I'm interacting. I am looking like I have no anxiety and that everything is just fine. And on the inside, I'm freaking out. And then I give it to God and He takes care of it. So another positive of having Asperger's, if you're a Christian, is it causes you to lean on God a lot. And guess what? He loves that because He's our Heavenly Father and we're His children. And He wants us to come to Him. He wants to take care of us and help us. Both Old and New Testaments talks about he wishes he could take his children under his wing like a hen gathers her babies. All right. Uh, so handling anxiety. Get saved if you're not saved already. Give it to God. All right. Jesus says that take his yoke upon you because his burden is light. Give your burdens to God and trust God to take care of it and to guide you. Okay, um, another thing having Asperger's, and this one has gotten me in a lot of messes, but it's also really funny, literal thinking. Uh, for example, wow, you're opening up a can of worms. I am picturing right now my can opener opening a can and a whole bunch of wiggling worms coming out. Um, and that lends to a uh, funny and quirky sense of humor. A lot of Aspies have some really wild sense of humors, and that's because of stuff like this. We think literally. So, of course, I know can of worms is a saying. I didn't used to know that, um, but I know that now. For example, another one. <laughs> um, when I was a teenager, uh, one of my friends, probably wasn't really a friend, uh, came up to me and said I had a big mouth. For years, I would look at myself in the mirror, and it's like, I don't see it. I don't think my mouth is that big. And I kid you not, it wasn't until a few months ago. And it's like, oh, does that mean he thought I talked a lot or loud or had something to do with my talking and not actually how my mouth looks? And it's like, oh, okay, so this isn't really big. Maybe it is big, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, another thing that I struggled with as a child in school, and this is another thing that made public school 
torture for me was I suffered from something that a lot of children with Asperger's suffers from, and that's selective mutism. I still have that a little bit, but it's a lot less. Uh, selective mutism is when you get enough anxiety in a situation or when something is coming up that you're very uncomfortable with, but that neurotypicals are very comfortable with, you can't talk. You can't talk. And it's selective mutism. You become mute, but it's a selective mutism. It only happens in certain situations at certain times, and it doesn't last a very long time. I had selective mutism in public school. When a teacher would call on me to answer questions, most of the time I'm like, and I'd get in trouble because I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't say anything. I could not talk. I wanted to say something. <laughs> I was scared to death. Everybody was looking at me, <laughs> and I couldn't talk. Um, I used to get in trouble in uh, public school for not going up to the teacher and asking for help on things I didn't understand. Well, I didn't for two reasons. One, going up to people is very hard for me, and it still is. And two, I would be so freaked out about going up to them that even if I went up to them, it would be, I can't talk. So, um, yeah, selective mutism, uh, that was annoying. Um, because of uh, us not falling into the normal um, social norms of the neurotypical world in which we reside, uh, we're often ostracized. Uh, if you've seen some of my previous videos, I've been kicked out of churches. I did not behave badly. I never caused a scene. I didn't do anything wrong. I get kicked out because I am weird. All right, I got kicked out of uh, one church because uh, I was writing uh, a series on my blog about middle tribulation rapture, but the pastor is super staunchly pre-tribulation rapture. I got kicked out of another church because I didn't read emotions in people's eyes, and I was told I didn't talk with the women enough, and I talked with the men too much. Um, so we get uh, kicked out of things, and even if not kicked out, we just get ostracized, ignored, pushed off to the side. Um, went to a church once. I actually had been going to that church for about two years, and uh, we had uh, a lunch fellowship. And um, so everybody, you know, you it was a potluck. You go up, you grab your food, you sit down. Well, my kids, they're neurotypicals. Bless their hearts. I am so glad they're neurotypical. Um, they ask, Mommy, can we go sit with our friends? Yes. Go sit with your friends. Have fun. I sit down at the table, and I start eating. Halfway through my eating, I look around and notice... I'm the only one at the whole table. The whole table. No one sat down by me. Now, I could say, well, yeah, but I didn't do what my children did and go find someone to sit with, so that's my fault. Yeah, I could have gone and sit, sat down by someone, but again, I don't like going up to people, and I am bad at starting conversations. Um, when I do go up to people, when I have to pass and I try to start a conversation, I kid you not, I usually get this weird stare that I don't know what it means, and then they turn around and walk off. So uh, I, when you've tried to do something long enough and you keep getting a bad result every time, you stop trying to do it because you're really tired of the bad results. And when you have something that you just don't know how you're doing it wrong or how to fix, then you're kind of stuck. If it was extremely important to me, I'm sure somebody can tell me. I could probably get a neurotypical to coach me and to stand by me and cue me, but um, I don't really care that much. You see, there's two types of Aspies in this respect. There's the extroverted Aspies who really want friends, and they really do want to socialize and get out there, and then there's the introverted Aspie. My personality type is INTJ. I am introverted, intuitive, thinking, judging. Okay, um, that's an extremely rare personality type. So you take that, you combine it with my having Asperger's and that I am extremely left-brained. And guess what? Socializing isn't that big of a deal to me. Um, where it upsets me is uh, when uh, people uh, become hurt or when people get mad at me from my point of view for no reason because I can't figure out what happened. That's upsetting. But guess what? That's just a part of life. Um, it happens, it happens, there's not really anything that I can do about it except for pray and move on and give it to God. Alright, um, something I constantly struggle with that does annoy me and that I'm constantly trying to fix and I've gotten better but I'm not nearly as better as I want to be and that's voice modulation. I embarrass myself. I guess uh, I talk loud. Um, 
or my tone and inflections are sometimes off as well and uh, at home that doesn't matter but out and about I talk loud and my husband tells me that makes people think that I'm trying to talk to them too or that makes people think I'm talking at them and I am not doing either um, I don't know why I have such a struggle with this but a lot of people with Asperger's do figuring out what the corrective volume is for my voice and then even after I figure out what the corrective volume is actually getting it to that volume for some reason it's really hard now some Aspies talk really quiet um, and I've talked to some really quiet talkers I can't hear you <laughs> see that's another thing I do have um, audio processing issues which a lot of Aspies have um, my hearing is fine in fact I have super hearing I hear stuff other people don't hear and some of the stuff I hear hurts my ears but other people can't hear it. Uh, okay, but um, hearing what someone is saying, then my brain has to translate it, and um, I have a delay sometimes on that, uh, so it might take me a bit longer to respond uh, than a neurotypical, and that's also an inconvenience in conversation, because then they move on and keep talking when I'm still trying to work out my brain what they just said so that I can respond. And so then I'll get behind, I won't know what they're talking about, and I'm lost in the conversation, and they just think I'm some weirdo again. Um, also, if we're in a busy room, a crowded room, a noisy room, a whole bunch of people are talking, understand that as an Aspie, um, I'm hearing everything. Everything. So you standing in front of me talking, I'm hearing that person over there, that person over there, that person across the room. I'm hearing the stupid fan whooshing on the ceiling. I'm hearing the stupid fluorescent lights humming, which are driving me nuts. I'm hearing the car door slam outside. I'm hearing the car alarm down the street. I'm hearing the in-heat cat in the alleyway out the back door. So, hearing you talking to me, don't be surprised if I'm staring intently at your lips and trying to read your lips. <laughs> because, um... It's very hard for uh, most of us Aspies to hear a person and hold a conversation in a noisy, crowded room. And by the way, crowds. Crowds are horrible. Um, a few weeks ago or so, uh, we all went to um, a special uh, concert. It's called a Cine Concert. It was uh, Star Trek uh, for their 50th anniversary. A fabulous orchestra was playing uh, Star Trek music. And there was a huge, humongous movie screen in the background showing Star Trek scenes and whatnot. That was a blast. We had a lot of fun. Um, but going to uh, the building, we had to go down, down, downtown. I was so glad my husband was driving. Paid parking. I don't understand why people like big cities. I just, they're, they're, they freak me out. <laughs> um, and then uh, walked from our paid parking to uh, the concert place. And there was this huge, huge, I mean, crowds and crowds and crowds and crowds of people um, all milling around outside. There were some tables set up here and there, and people were sitting at some tables. And, and uh, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, and these huge crowd of people are just outside of the steps of this concert place. So um, I'm thinking, let's weave through this concert, and let's get in there, and let's get our seats and just sit down. But my husband's thinking, um, you know, let's, uh, let's eat really quick. And I'm like, eat? I don't have any appetite. Look where we are. So uh, I'm standing like this, looking around at the crowd, praying that we can get away soon. And my husband and children are just hanging out and eating and having a good time. I'm standing there and I'm looking around like, why are all these people here? Are they all waiting to get in the concert building? Are the doors locked? So I was waiting to get through the crowd and to go find out if the doors were locked. Why were all those people there? It was crowded. All right. Um, and another thing, sensory, I smell you. I smell you. If you stink, I know it. Okay, I smell you. Everybody has a scent, and I uh, oftentimes can recognize a person by their scent before I recognize them any other way. So when I'm in a crowd, I smell them. <laughs> it's not always very pleasant. Okay, so they finally finish eating. They get cleaned up, and my husband's like, so, should we hang out for a bit? You know, we got to. I'm like, no, let's go get our seats. <laughs> And we head in, and to my surprise, the doors to the concert hall are open. We walk in, it's not very crowded in there. I'm like, huh, do they, those, those huge crowds of people out there not know that you can just walk in? What, what are they waiting for? What, what are they waiting for? So I'm just wondering that I didn't say anything. Uh, we sit down, you know, get all comfy, uh, take some pictures and stuff before the concert started, and did some funny and wacky poses and all that. And... Um, and then I decided, you guys can figure out, what was that crowd there for? What were they waiting for? So I asked my husband, what was all those people waiting for out there? And he's like, waiting? What are you talking about? I'm like, 
well, it wasn't very crowded inside, but there was that huge crowd out there. What, what were they waiting for? And he said, well, they're not waiting for anything. They're hanging out. And I'm like, hanging out? And he goes, yeah, it was a Saturday. It's like Saturday night. They go to places like this and they just meet their friends and hang out and talk. They do it for fun. What? <laughs> That, that didn't dawn on me. That was weird because that just looked horrible to me. <laughs> so that was just something that was really funny to me. Um, I would never, 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 never purposely do that. Now, I go out there and I socialize and I do things way more than I want to. It is a labor of love as a mother to my four extroverted neurotypical children and for my neurotypical husband who, thank God, is introverted, but barely. <laughs> um... So, yeah, it, it's a labor of love. I will go out and socialize and do things for the sake of my children. When they're all 18, I'm going to be a shut-in. <laughs> yes, it wasn't just the people met their friends and hung out. It was like a little street market thing. And they had little booths where you could buy, like, you know, uh, like some kind of a submarine sandwiches and that kind of thing. And uh, you were so cute, Everlove. Uh. You should have seen my sweetie when she was in the middle of all that. <laughs> you were so cute, Everlove. It was very claustrophobic. <laughs> now, <clears throat> my question to you is, how much of your crowd anxiety is due to the fact that when you were a kid, the crowd at the public school was cruel to you? I don't know that that really plays into it a whole lot because the crowd is just there's a whole bunch going on at once and I don't know where to look or what to try to focus on or where to go because everything's all squishy. Okay, so there's the sensory thing, but you're not, so you're not, are you worried about somebody coming and getting you though? No. Not okay, paranoid. So, so it's just the, uh, it's just all the sensory thing. Yeah, it's too much. And weird. I don't know why people would find that fun. It's weird. Okay, so I guess we're not planning that for next Saturday night then. No. Every yeah, up. That sounds fine <laughs> with me. Yeah. Yeah, you see, um, I can go to parties or stay home. Either way. I can stay home. I'm 3% uh, introvert. Right on almost a dividing line. Go either way. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, Asperger's and emotions. Um, it's said that Aspies don't have empathy. Um, I've heard a lot of Aspies argue that, but when I hear their arguments, it sounds more to me like they're arguing for sympathy rather than empathy. We have sympathy. I, I can feel sympathy for someone. I do a lot. Um, most of the time you can't tell. I uh, don't know how to express it in a way that people understand it, uh, so I just feel it. And uh, you probably have no idea I'm feeling it, and oh well, that's fine. They, they're my emotions, they're not yours. So, um, But empathy is when uh, someone's going through something and you imagine if you were going through it and then you feel what they're feeling. That's not happening. Um, because, for one, the amygdala of the brain of an Asperger is different and that's a lot of where the empathy action is going to be taking place from. Okay. Um, for me personally, I can sympathize, but I empathizing, unless I really have been through that sim situation, I can't empathize simply because I haven't been through that situation. I'm supposed to sit here and imagine myself being in a situation I've never been through before and then have those emotions that you're having. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I think uh, empathy in that respect is actually just... Um, uh, self-disillusionment. It's a uh, self-trickery. It's uh, you're either going to have it right or you're not going to have it right. But unless you have some type of extrasensory power, you're just guessing. All right. So um, rather than shoot for empathy, just to shoot for sympathy. That makes more sense. Um, so yeah, uh, different brains. I've talked about that throughout. We do literally have different brains. All sorts of different types of brain scan tests have shown it. Uh, we do not have a disorder. We do not have a syndrome. There is nothing wrong with us. Our brains are just larger. We have different amygdalas, uh, and we have different wiring of the brain. Well, oh, Everlovin, do you have any plans? Yes. I think so. <laughs> Look at the size of this. All right. Um, 
at the end of the video now, at the, uh, you know, I mean, actually, where is it in the box, the description box? Description box below. My wife has found some very cool videos that will help both Aspies and people who are non-Aspies. One of them is a documentary made by a girl whose mother was very good at helping her out, just like Temple Grandin's mother was very good at helping her out. And uh, she did a documentary about Aspies. The cool thing about her documentary, which is about an hour long, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, <coughs> is that there's people, one, a couple of the people that she interviews in there give some very helpful systems on how to be friendly with people and uh, get along well because he had to develop those systems being an Aspie but it'll work for our regular people too you get some of those tricks that this guy had well you could be the social butterfly <laughs> he was really cool all right so there you go um, thanks for watching